Okay, and welcome to another edition of uh, the Psych Monologues. I, uh, I'm Dr. Ray Mitch, your host. If you're just checking this out for the first time in the new year, you, you may have made one of those uh, uh, interesting resolutions, which I, I think are a waste of time, personally. Um, uh, resolutions to check out some new podcasts in the area that you have some interest or whatever. Thank you for joining us. Um, what you're joining is, um, and you may have may have gotten referred by somebody you know or whatever, um, but it, the, the Psych Monologues itself is a podcast exploring the intersection of faith, psychology, and spiritual formation. Again, in a, a lot of cases, what at least in the Christian world, we don't really connect those things up. We Faith and spiritual formation, absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. But psychology is looked at, at the best, with a wary eye. At the worst, as an antagonistic uh, ideology set against our faith. Now, it depends on what kind of psychology you're talking about. And I think we've got to keep that in mind. You may not know anything other than what you've heard or from the pulpit or anywhere else. So be that as it may, the Psych Monologues is trying to uh, meet at this intersection and uh, invite people into some kind of dialogue about it. So um, the the podcast itself is an outgrowth of uh, an organization called SGI or Stained Glass International. And the mission of Stained Glass is to equip, encourage, and empower the next generation of Christians to live authentically uh, uh, in relationship to Jesus and others and themselves. So I basically, if I were to boil it all down to what it is we're trying to do with SG International, I just refer to SGI because it's just simpler, um, is is what I call the outpost for the heart. Excuse me. Outposts for the heart, and I, I mean, think about it. If you're in a, a culture that is pressing you one way, or and and you're resisting it or whatever, oftentimes we're looking for an outpost where we can take our armor off and have a conversation and and talk about the things of the heart. That's where ordinary courage lies. That's where. That's where we find ourselves, really, in a lot of ways. And I can't present myself to someone else if I don't find myself or know the self that I have. So um, Outpost for the Heart is not a place just to have a bitch session. It's not a place for that. It, it's a place to share stories of what we have, what our uh, life experiences are. That That's really about it. It's not, it's not necessarily, and this is key, okay? Because whenever I say necessarily, people tune out. <laughs> but it's not necessarily a, a problem-solving thing. Okay, so what can I do? As much as it, is it as it is to create a context where I'm safe enough to talk about the things that I otherwise edit out in the world out there, if you will. So, um, so in Scripture, it also often uses something called parallelism. So, And I'm using that same thing. Um, in terms of what we're trying to accomplish here for uh, uh, SGI, and that is Outposts for the Heart and Communities for the Soul. And there's been a huge emphasis in a lot of ways into uh, the, the body and what goes on in the body and neurology or ne- neurological uh, function and everything else. And we end up emphasizing that to the exclusion of, of the larger person that we're talking about. And that's really what Psych Monologues is trying to engage some kind of conversation that is broad enough and and willing to handle the tensions between um, the body and the soul and the soul having an equal standing, not a lesser standing, to the body. The body we can see, obviously. So um, so that's kind of the landscape of where, what I've been heading toward as psych monologues have grown and as as uh, SGI has been birthed. And so pull up a chair. Uh, welcome to January 2nd. We're in a new year, and that's why I'm trying something new this time uh, with a video blog. Uh, it, it, a few years ago, they used to call it a vlog, but it doesn't quite have the, 
ring to it, I suppose. So um, if you're interested and you want to see the video component or watch what I'm doing as I'm talking um, on the podcast, uh, you can do that. You can find it at drmitch.com and look under uh, uh, look under um, uh, the the Psych Monologues podcast, and you'll you'll see it there. There will be a blog entry, or and I'll have to look, update you later. The other place to look is in the blog itself, um, the Out of Ashes blog. You you might find it there too. So if all else fails, if all else fails, and you want to find it at YouTube, it will probably be there, and then we'll we'll. Um, kind of embed it in, uh, in the Psych Monologue or the um, Out of Ashes website, you can find it at bitl.ly. Uh, and be careful, because I tried to do this in my own browser. When I did it, it forced me into bit.ly.com. While that is the service I'm using to, to shorten this ridiculously long and idiotic um, H, you know, uh, web address, uh, it, it will force you into that and then you'll be, be saying where in the heck is this thing so it's it's bit.ly uh, and then forward slash psych, psych monologues and you'll find us there so now uh, if you like it give me the feedback I can take it I'm I'm open to feedback if you want to see this more often and uh, I and certainly I, I have in the back of my mind if, if Lord willing and the creek don't rise um, we're able to get some interviews and we'll have some interviews um, that will also have a video component to it. So this is kind of the uh, foray into this uh, media and trying it out for size and seeing how it works. So, um, so in a sense, uh, with SGI, as I, I as I've thought about it, it's like we've gotten on the SGI plane and we're just taking off, and you can't get your tray table down. You're stuck there listening to the um, safety. Uh, uh, the safety spiel that the uh, flight attendants are, are are telling you. So I'll make it kind of entertaining. I will grant you that. But I'm not going to be that entertaining, I don't think. Um, but all that being said, we're not at flying altitude yet. There are plenty of things that we're trying to get in place uh, so that this just is a more full-featured, um, uh, valuable place for you to show up and listen to things that hopefully matter to you, and that's really what it's all about. Um, the, the things that where that are relevant to where you live and how you relate, how you think, um, and, and how you feel really about living life with yourself and others and Jesus. So all of that is part of SGI. It is also part of the psych monologues in my effort. Now, what I wanna do, let's, let's finally get to the, the crux of the matter here rather than all this housekeeping stuff is what I want to do just to get out of the gate uh, for the year is to talk about something that has I have seen over and over again uh, in a lot of people's interactions with each other uh, and certainly the younger generation's interactions with the older generation and I can speak to that because I'm part of that generation and in a lot of ways, because I teach at a university, I feel a little bit like I'm straddling two worlds in a lot of ways uh, because I hear uh, what the younger world, if you will, is throwing bombs at the older set about things like not listening or things like pontificating or being dogmatic or whatever. <clears throat> and what I want to say before I even get into this is the, the, the reality here is this, this, this is a blade, okay? This, this is a blade. This, this blade will cut both ways. It cuts into both generations and both populations. Now, I am not, and hear me, I am not going to walk into no man's land where I can get shot by both, although I have been there, and it's not pleasant, but I'm willing to go there, and that's that's what this what that's what today really kind of represents is I, I want to go in and, and call each of the quote unquote warring parties um, out to no man's land to say let let's let's have an honest conversation now the, the keys to this conversation is what I would call connecting or correcting and the older generation tends to err on the correcting side and the younger one errs 
and it's an error. It's a, it is an error on the connecting side. And you say, well, how, how can connecting be an error? Because it's to the exclusion of everything else. It, 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 both are errors, okay? Both are errors, but they, they say, I want you to come to my territory or, or you're wrong. And, and, and we can't figure out how to adapt not change our language to say the right thing because that's easier. That's we will do that, and nothing changes. I might add, just because you change your language about it, and that's so. Even in a larger culture, we've changed the language about a lot of things, but that doesn't change the reality of it. And and so that being said, I I, I want to lay out some pitfalls and problems in both of those things and then try to bring the two together by the end and and see kind of where we are with all of that so let's start with correcting and i know this one because this is part of my generation where the emphasis was on really right thinking and right practice and on a previous podcast i've talked a little bit about that the the orthodoxy which is right belief and orthopraxy, which is right practice, okay, right practice. And there's a third one that I talked about on the on the previous podcast, and you can go looking for it if you want, if you're really interested. But it's something that is called orthocardia. So instead of orthodoxy, right, right belief, and you can see where this is going if you anticipate the word, all right, <clears throat> or orthopraxy, right practice. Versus orthocardia, which is right heart. And correcting, in, in a lot of ways, even the younger gender, I see this with them with each other, is the error is made that I have to change how somebody else thinks rather than, than anything else. Because the belief is, is that how we think is so important that once I change, quote unquote, how I think, then my behavior will change. And while there is a germ of truth to that, because a lot of our false beliefs, you know, really do drive our behavior. And, and it, particularly in this debate between generations, that's for sure. But we make our priority what someone is thinking rather than the person themselves, him or her, her herself. And I, like I said, there's an error in here that says, if I can get you to think differently just by telling you how to think differently or pointing out the errors in your thinking, then things will be better for you. And, and the interesting thing about it is that it is experienced. Now, intent is not the same as how something's experienced. But it is, an, it is experienced as an imposition on another person. The other person feels like, you know, my relationship with this person is, is in danger. And, and if I don't comply, which is all it is, if I don't comply, then I will lose my relationship with them. Well, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I got to take a drink here. I feel it coming. That's the, the one thing that's missing here, which is holding on to both things, right? Is the, the essence of relationship. And <clears throat> one generation gives lip service to relationship. That's the correcting generation, if you want to put it that way. And the other generation puts the emphasis on relationship. And, <clears throat> and that's... So one puts the emphasis on truth and thinking rightly and all of those sorts of things. And the other generation puts all the emphasis on relationship. And that's really all that matters. Truth is, is kind of secondary. And when you have that, you have, you have a war on your hands. And it turns into a lens in terms of how they see each other. But because of the, 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 threat of loss of relationship, which is so important to the other person, 
they will comply with the right thinking thing, thinking that that's the only way that I can keep somebody else in relationship with me is if I think rightly, think how they want me to. So in essence, what it does is it steals their right to choose. So when I'm so busy trying to tell somebody how to think, and, I, and, and they're connecting it up with the relationship, <laughs> then they're going to value the relationship over the thinking and they will comply and say the right thing and look the right way, but not be really all in when it comes to the nature of the connection. So they split themselves. Now, the way this correcting thing works is that it is experienced as insensitive and not really caring what the other person experiences, not really caring at all. And that's, a problem. Now, again, we tend to argue against one or the other of these positions from the extreme because I can hear <clears throat> even some people in my generation saying, yeah, but if I emphasize how the person experiences something, then they'll never come around to the truth. Well, maybe. Maybe. You don't know that. I don't know that. And the, the reality is, is the truth really changes people when they choose or even discover it rather than be told it all the time. Now, I'm not saying, again, we can argue from the extreme and say, yeah, but that means you'll never tell them anything. No, I'm not saying that at all. But I better have some relational capital in my back pocket if I am going to point out, because we don't speak the truth, we speak we speak to correct an error. And that's a different thing. There is such a thing as embodied truth. Like how I relate to somebody is embodied truth, right? So it, it is experienced by the other person. And you can choose, just like I, I, I'm saying here, you can choose how you want to. And a lot of people will say, no, I don't. I don't. They won't say it, all right? They won't say it. But I don't really care about the relationship. I just care that I speak the truth right. That's all. So it's about them and speaking the truth rather than hearing and validating and connecting with the other person and then being able to speak the truth. Which, by the way, I might add, was a pri one of the primary, it wasn't the only one, but one of the primary methods that Jesus used in connecting with people. He connected with them relationally. Think of the woman at the well. He strikes up a conversation with him, with her, and she doesn't, he doesn't start with, I'm the Messiah, you need to worship me because I know what you're thinking and I know what kind of life you've led. He doesn't lead with that. He just simply makes a simple request. Can I have some water? And out of that conversation, because he knew that he was pushing the envelopes of social convention by asking a woman in Samaria, a Jew, asking that of a woman in Samaria at high noon or <clears throat> the, the heat of the day for a drink of water. He knew that. He, he, he knew what that was going to push. And she reacted probably as he anticipated and said, you know, who are you, a Jew, asking me, a Samaritan, to, to give you water? And now we've got a conversation because she's asking a question of him. So the thing to keep in mind is that when we make it our correcting how somebody thinks and, and making a priority of speaking the truth. Now, we love to clothe it with speaking the truth in love. Yeah, okay. What does that mean? Sometimes speaking the truth in love means not speaking at all. So low priority here is the relationship. High priority is right thinking and, and, or orthodoxy. And it implies, and this is not lost for those that are part of my generation. And I'm... <laughs> I'll just, I'll just say this. I was born in the 50s, okay? 
but it is experienced by this generation as you really don't care about me as a person. You only care what I believe. And there are some of my generation who would probably say, yeah, you're right. I do care about what you believe because you as a person and where you go in relationship to God or anything else is problematic. And there's, again, there's a germ of truth there. But the thing to keep in mind, us correcting people, is it diminishes the importance of another person's story or their history, particularly with the church or the Bible or God or people of faith who who can be, I think we would all agree, can be very dogmatic, very platitudinous, filled with platitudes, to, and it's a little bit like putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. And we feel it as a bullet wound, and they say it's just a scrape. And that that may not be fair, but tough. Tough. I Am I going to live by how they see the world, or am I going to impose my view of the world on them? And if, if I impose my view of the world on them, are they really changing or are they just simply complying? And what do I want? What do I want? So it also implies that what they believe is ultimately more important than their relationship with the church or with Jesus. Now, again, this, this can create a lot of angst, if you will, in the older generation because it's like, yeah, but what they believe is their relationship with the church and is their relationship with Jesus. And to that point, I, I would agree. I would agree. <clears throat> but how do we want to relate is, is the question. And this is the challenge, particularly of the people of my generation. Because we were taught, and I, I will speak because I, I lived there. I was in, in the crux of it all. We were taught to believe rightly, and that would lead to changed behavior. But I think if we were honest, it never really accomplished that. A lot of it did. A lot of it did. See, I'm, I'm making qualifications all the way through. I can feel myself doing that. Because... If we're going to paint things in black and white, all or nothing, then we will not capture the fullness of living life as a human. Because it's not as simple as that. Now, you you might want to make the world that simple. That's fine. You can. You can. But I would dare say you probably don't live that way. You probably live in the tension of the middle, if you will. I call it the messy middle. And and we live there, and we're always saying, I don't know how to make this decision. What kind of wisdom do I need to understand this? I don't have enough to make it, and i got to get more, or whatever whatever that is. So let me turn my attention to the connecting piece. So what about connecting, you ask? It's a good question. Thank you for asking it. But it places a priority on understanding rather than on any kind of fixing or problem solving. And it assumes that everything rides on getting someone's thinking right. And so in this case, the priority is understanding rather than problem solving. And the the connection piece of understanding where somebody's coming from is key to not just the goal of getting them to think right. If it is, then we're back to correcting. I, I've just taken a longer path. That's really all it is. But is connection enough and important enough for us to, to settle, if you want to put it that way, settle on the connection piece? And nothing else, nothing else. And is the person then free to choose because they're now in connection, in relationship 
with me and they see how I live life to then ask the kinds of questions that perhaps give me the opportunity to spend some of the relational capital I'm talking about in order to talk about the truth and what drives my decision making. So it connecting connecting is really everything is about the relationship. And, and I'll tell you the dirty little secret, I think, that comes from being a counselor for as long as I have. And and when we hit 2020, it was 40 years for me. And <clears throat> and you know I I don't have the I didn't have and I still don't because I still do some counseling but I I really didn't have the luxury <clears throat> and I I know some counselors do or they don't have the luxury but they take it um I didn't believe I had the luxury when somebody comes in and says. I, you know, I struggle with some kind of compulsive behavior. And in my way of thinking, there's a story behind that kind of succinct summary statement. And I think every counselor listening to this, if they are, would probably say, yeah, there probably is. And I need to know that story before I start leaping into this pool. And, and that's a, that's a counselor's way of thinking, if you will, okay? I am not asking everybody to be a counselor, but I am asking people to be committed to relationship, which requires the same kinds of skills that we uniquely provide people in the counseling office. It, you're not immune just because you're not, quote unquote, a counselor. You're not immune from that responsibility to connect with people. But that means hearing the story first rather than wading in with all of these fixing comments or problem solving comments to get it fixed for them. They, are they asking for that? And, you know, ultimately, I mean, if you're really going to push that envelope, you could say, what do you want from me? But most people are going to say, I don't know. I just want somebody to listen. Oh, now, now you now we've got a clear decision to make, right? Because how do I listen? Do I listen to correct or do I listen to connect? So they, they really don't buy what we're saying, you know, particularly, particularly the correcting people. They really don't buy what we say in terms of the Holy Spirit being the one who actually changes people when we spend all of our time trying to change them. Okay, so... Going into this, see, correcting is an either-or way of thinking. This is more of a both-and way of thinking. And, and either-or is either it's this or it's that. Black or white, all or nothing. Both-and says, yeah, it's both of these things. But we don't like that level of uncertainty and ambiguity. We hate it. And that's why we reduce the world into nice, easy, clean little categories. And essentially what it does in this connecting idea is it affirms that con the connection lays the foundation for potential belief change. Potential belief change. It does not guarantee belief change. It does not guarantee belief change. Can I, do I have to say that again? So it doesn't, you know, if we say that I believe the Holy Spirit is actually what changes people, but then I spend all of my time trying to change people, then there's a disconnect then, right? It's like, well, if I don't do anything, then the Holy Spirit won't. Well, that's what's implied. And maybe the fact that I can relate to somebody graciously with acceptance no matter where they are, no matter what their sexual orientation is or what kind of relationships they're in or whatever, I can accept people where they are, that perhaps then we can have, have a conversation about that. Maybe we don't. And then I am just a building block in a bigger 
picture, a bigger mosaic that God is is creating of this person's life. <clears throat> so there are a couple, there, there's one thing I want to make sure that you understand is that connection provides a context. It provides a context. You you can't exercise the possibility of changing your beliefs if you're not in a context that you feel safe enough and allows you to discover the flaws in that thinking. See, our stereotypes are never changed if we never push into people that are different than us, that we have stereotyped into a nice, clean category. And we won't, we won't confront that. And I, I have seen this time and time again, even in the groups that I run at CCU, because students have concepts just like everybody else does. They have stereotypes about people, and then they find themselves in a group with a person and being challenged to, to, to open their hearts to one another. And they say, I don't, I'm not going to be vulnerable with people I don't even know. Okay, then don't. Then don't. But eventually they do. And it's because they've been given the permission to say no. Because if I give somebody the permission to say no, then they're also free to say yes. And so I, I have to provide some kind of context that provides an environment for the person to wrestle with the hurt and anger of, of not being met in, in, in not being met and being corrected. And that's what often happens. See, the, the reality is, okay, is everybody comes to this conversation with a lens. Everybody comes to this conversation with conclusions. And a lot of those conclusions are driven by hurt and anger. A lot of them are. Hurt and anger over not being listened to. And ironically, the connecting people is hurt and anger over not being listened to, ironically. And so connection, the relationship we have with one another, which connection is at the most basic level of how we're wired because connection is the fabric of community. And so it, it ultimately provides a place where one can admit and look at the anger and hurt and what's driving even their theological stance rather than any kind of thought through critique of the church and the people who populate it. You know, this is the dirty little secret that everybody nods their head and says, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But the church has been flawed from the very beginning. When you, for the, from the very beginning, why? Because it's populated with humans. And there's always been these kind of debates and misunderstandings in younger generation, older generation, and it's always been this way. And I would say, I would hazard to guess that if there are anybody that have come together to look at their preconceived notions, stereotypical notions of one another, and simply sit down and have a conversation, dialogue about life, as they experience it with both parties being committed to, to listening, 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 not listening to correct, <clears throat> but listening to understand, I would hazard to guess that some of the major reawakenings in faith occurred by that, that kind of context, if you will. So the last thing is it provides a place to explore our disappointment with God safely and, and even make it possible to change that perspective that allows him to define himself rather than him being defined by our own need for comfort or happiness or ease or anger at him. or And, and, and let's face it, a lot of our anger is, is built on a, a disappointment with God in not fulfilling our expectations of how he should be, how he should be. And I can tell you from a long history, I, I'm, I'm now pushing 50 years in the faith. 
And there's a long history of, I did it one way, I did it. I, I, I towed the line, I thought the right way, I did all of those things. But the problem is, as longer I did that, it became a contract with God that he didn't sign. And I created images of who God was that wasn't consistent with how he reveals himself. And we don't, our anger then comes at that and our hurt does too. And that doesn't diminish the importance or the the feelings of abandonment and hurt and anger. You'll find them written all over the pages of scripture. If you want to look, you will find them in the, the prophets like Jeremiah, who's really pissed at God. Read Lamentations. Why is it called Lamentations? Because it's the lament over the loss of his people and God not coming through like he thought he should. Sound familiar? So what? I mean, okay. So what? I mean, now that we know. And a lot of times the things that I feel, even as I go through the podcast, and talking about these things is I make you aware of a variety of things. And the unfortunate part is oftentimes we, we, we draw it in and we say, yep, that's what it is. Yep. Oh, that's good point. Blah, 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 whatever, whatever. And, and then we dust off our feet and move on and nothing really changes. And that's what the, so what part of this is, right? Because the challenge is you can have somebody that is in the connection side of this argument who is of the older generation. That would be me. I emphasize that. I don't emphasize that to the exclusion, for all of my correcting friends, to the exclusion of the truth. I'm not. At any given point in time, it looks like I am. But I always have a clear understanding in the back of my mind about if I don't build this bridge very well, then I am going to fall through into the abyss after it, when it breaks. When it breaks down, and it will. Oh, it will. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt and went home. Multiple times, actually. Because we love to solidify and make certainty on our contracts with God are, is that way of creating certainty. And the funny thing about certainty is I may get certainty, but I've lost trust. Because I don't need to trust if I've got everything figured out and certain. I don't have to. And so living in the ambiguous, some would even say, and I would agree, living in the mystery of what I don't know, which is a lot, actually, might actually prompt an act of trust rather than demanding certainty in order to move forward. Now, the one thing about certainty is it always provides what it guarantees. And you say, well, that's why that's why I like that. But the one thing about trust is there's no guarantee of outcome. But there is a quote-unquote guarantee of connection. Is that enough? And I think for a lot of people, and I've been there, I think for a lot of people, connection with God isn't enough. He's got to produce. Because only then the connection is really worth it. And so it's not really a connection. It's a trade. And, and our, our words are betraying us then because it's not about connection, right? It's about outcome. And that's, that's a key aspect that we, I think we have to wrestle out in our relationship with God and with each other. I mean, we go into relationships doing exactly the same thing. So, okay, so what? Well, here we are. You know, we're sitting at, you know, January 2nd. And we head into, we sort, sort of still in kind of this holiday mode. And then you go into and dive into the relationships that probably haven't changed much since you left them back in 23rd or 24th of December. They're still there. They're still waiting. 
<clears throat> then what difference does it make in how you relate to somebody? And it's a really hard habit to break, this correcting thing. <clears throat> it's a really hard habit to break. But if I can find a way, and I say me because it is still me, even in even in the in where I'm at, I mean I I because of the years I've done this and, and all the reading that I've done and everything else, it's tempting to take all the content and just back it up and dump it on people and say, there, it'll make things better. And it's like, it, it, when I really look at it, it's just to look important when it really comes right down to it. Look, look, you know, wise or whatever crap that I'm kind of trying to come up with. So I, I, I guess the question then becomes is how do you relate and I have said this before, but the, the, the process of change always starts with, always starts with awareness. So you go through your day and you notice how you relate to one another, other people in your life. Are you parsing what they're th saying to correct them? Or are you just reveling in the things that they're telling you about and asking questions and trying to understand it a little bit more fully? And it's just as subtle as that. It doesn't seem like much, but it, it's as subtle as that because it's a change and your awareness then turns into, oh, there it is. I saw myself do it. It's called identification. And so now that I've identified it, now I can start making some changes. And then I go back. So I try to make some changes and I do less of that. Not all, all or nothing. Don't fall back into that again. But... I do less of that and and then I see the outcomes and I judge the outcomes by how it how the other person relates to me what their what our relationship is like and then reevaluate and try it again and it's always try it again it's never now I got it because as humans we're always dealing with moving targets namely other people and ourselves, I might add, and see what happens. I'd be curious to hear what happens if you notice that propensity of yours. So, okay, so that's it for today. Some words of, of, of uh, no, I'm not going to say wisdom, but words to consider for the day. And this is a rare time. I don't usually do my podcasts at, in the middle of the day. Um, so I'm, I'm, if you look at the video, I'm, I'm constantly trying to control the light sources. And so I don't look too uh, uh, washed out here. But end of reminders, end of program reminders, just a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, uh, you know, if you have questions, DM, DM me on, on Instagram. I'd be happy to entertain them, uh, maybe even put them onto the website, uh, put them into, I should say, the podcast. And then we also have a new feature, and it, this is new for the year. It will remain, uh, but you can subscribe and be notified of any new content on the website. But the only way you do that is by subscribing. We're not going to use your email address. We're not going to hit you up with anything other things other than just simply the subscription to the website and hearing about new content that comes up. So please sign up. <clears throat> on that, there's a little pop-up window that shows up on, on the Out of Ashes. Coming up in the near future, uh, we're, we're going to be launching the, the uh, SD, Inter SG, SD, SG International um, website. And so you'll have two places to visit. Uh, probably your base of operations will be SG International. Um, Out of Ashes is going to be, become my personal website. And so you can get my books and you can look at videos and other things that I'm producing. Uh, but SG International will be for most of the activity coming out of Stained Glass International. So you can follow us on any of the social, three social media outlets, Instagram, at the Psych Monologues, Facebook, Ray.Mitch, and then LinkedIn, Dr. Mitch. So some of those are going to change and I will keep you appraised as we, we change them and move over into uh, a full identity, if you will, of uh, SG International. 
um, it, with the podcast, if you like what you've heard, review about it and and sign up and subscribe. Um, uh, we can be found on any of the platforms that you you listen to podcasts on. That includes Spotify, iTunes, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, any of those. Um, and then the blog, like I said, I think this video blog is going to show up on the blog. I don't know that for sure. Uh, but the only way to find out is hit the website and see what you think. Um, and I gave you the backup so that if it doesn't show up on the website just yet, uh, you can get it and look at it on my, uh, my um, what is it called? Uh, my YouTube channel. So if you're interested in partnering with us, we are very grateful. I am most grateful. Um, and it, we need to continue to grow the scholarship fund for uh, the silent retreats. Uh, and we also just need uh, uh, support for the overall mission of SG International um, because of uh, this year, I think, Lord willing again, um, it, we will be producing a variety of resources and things for groups uh, that people want to start up uh, <clears throat> groups. Don't know what we call them. Um, I'm open to any ideas. Uh, but if you're interested in partnering with us, I am ever so grateful. Uh, this this is you know this is not a cost free undertaking, uh, and so uh, your your gifts and donations are tax deductible, um, and so you can do that on the donate button at the bottom of uh, the Out of Ashes website, my website drmitch.com. If you prefer to do a physical check, you can send it to. Uh, Stained Glass International, P.O. Box uh, 160, East Lake, Colorado, 80614. Um, you make your check out to Stained Glass International or SGI. Either one is fine. Um, and uh, uh, we would be ever so grateful for your support in supporting the website and supporting our podcast and supporting uh, our efforts to resource people that are interested in creating outposts for the heart. So there it is. Thanks so much for uh, 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 <clears throat> staying with me all the way through this kind of pilot edition of a video blog and the regular regular blog. If you just want to consume that, you're going to find that in your usual places. Uh, but uh, thanks so much for joining me. And as always, love you. Later. Later.